So the agenda is very clear, uh, pardon the pun, clearing as it exists today, the scale and scope of clearing and the challenges and the pro proposed solutions and some uh, anatomy of a use case and then the solution which will be presented uh, by money. And we are not talking about some uh, pie in the sky stuff here. Money is actually building stuff and he's almost, uh, you know, 40 to 80%, I mean, about 80% complete with that. So uh, we are not in discussion or POC stages, okay? Um, so uh, going back to the uh, presentation, uh, is about processes to control risk uh, legal and other kind of risk. Um, can you hear me? Yeah, uh, yeah. Is, okay. is it clear? Okay. Yeah. Um, because I just got a message saying my internet connection is unstable. Um, so we're going through all kinds of problems. Messages, um, uh, of course, messages consist of uh, electronic messages, acknowledgements, uh, everybody maintains their own infrastructure and so on. Uh, and the payments, and so the first A, B, C, and D, uh, well, maybe A and B concerns trading itself. Uh, and these clearing is a post trade activity. So in payments and settlements, because Clearing payments settlements can be operated through one entity um, and the settlement activity can be done through RTGS, a real-time gross settlement, uh, which is immediate and irrevocable and it uses central bank money. Deferred net Netting settlement or called DNS is basically a way to bunch up trades and then settle uh, and net the trades and settle them. It addresses one of the major problems with RTGS. RTGS is immediate settlement. So if you're doing bilateral settlement immediately all the time, the liquidity, it is the safest form meaning you've traded, you've settled, gone. But the liquidity needs, the liquidity, uh, which is the most, one of the most important uh, parameters for survivability uh, is highest in RTGS. That means in deferred netting and settlement, for example, in, um, in uh, DTCC, about 200 million transactions per day are netted down to 1 million transactions per day. So that means it is going to be just about 0.5% of the transactions. Uh, uh, I mean, in, in terms of raw volume, it reduces to that. That means all of the uh, opposing trades are canceled uh, or you know netted together and then um, you get to a point where you only have to uh, do one million transactions per day, but it introduces another risk, which is because of the delay, it obviously uh, means that positions remain unsettled for two days for most, T plus two for most. And it also introduces a pause in the system. We'll go through this in, in slightly more detail later. Uh, and then there's hybrid, which is uh, a way to introduce a liquidity saving mechanism into the, uh, into the settlement process so that we can save liquidity and cut down on the risk. So how does the CCP operate? Can you go to the next uh, slide, please, Money? So the CCP, which is a central counterparty, is a buyer to every seller and seller to every buyer, which means they are interposing themselves 
between the, the buyer and the seller, and it is done legally through UCC and through uh, the fact that they maintain the books and they can just do a book transfer. So no physical transfer of anything. It is all maintained uh, in a dematerialized form. That means it is no, no longer paper certificates or anything like that. It just gets switched in the books of, uh, of uh, DDCC, for example, in the US and in other locations, other uh, uh, CCPs operate. Sometimes, uh, the settlement authority, the custodian, custodian, all of these are different. And of course, even here, uh, custody is uh, handled by big banks. The risk management is through margins and pooled collateral, and the default risk is shared. That means if one party defaults, then it doesn't co uh, cause a uh, collapse of the system. But the systemic risk is still present in the form of the DTCC itself because they take money collateral from everybody uh, in order to manage that risk. Um, they do have an uh, intermediate mark to market, uh, which is what uh, the Robin Hood saga exposes. That means you deposit a certain amount of money with the DTCC and if your intraday exposure exceeds that due to mark, mark to market, then you have to post additional collateral. Uh, that is the, that's, that's what happened. So even though you're settling in two days time, they keep, uh, DTCC keeps a tally a running tally of what your exposure is. And if your exposure rises suddenly, any dealer or, or a counterparty has to post uh, extra collateral. Uh, anyway, so the diagram below uh, exhibits what is there. Uh, basically, everybody interacts through the financial market infrastructure, FMIA here, which is, um, which is basically the uh, central counterparty. Um, next slide, please. So here, more complex uh, central counterparty interactions are preserved here, uh, are shown here also from the same, uh, reference that I took uh, here, multiple CCPs in the same jurisdiction, interacting with other FMIs in the other jurisdictions. Next slide, please. So what are the challenges? We, all, we already kind of went through some of them, but the longer the settlement cycle and delay increases the risk. Obviously, it also increases the compression. That means that like, for example, 200 to one compression, you're able to get uh, by netting. Uh, if we were to increase the settlement cycle to one month, which used to be the case before, um, the netting Psych, uh, netting increases, uh, I mean, the netting efficiency increases a lot. Obviously, you cannot have 24 seven trading because you have to pause for the deferred net settlement. You have to pause all activity so that everything can be tallied up, totaled up and netted in order to do this. So you cannot have 24 seven trading if you have DNS. And the third one, which is obviously because of the uh, unforeseen effects, there can be regulatory capital calls in the middle of the uh, heavy trading or volatile trading. And the fourth 
is the books and records are not timely. Uh, two days, you know, things are in flight. And plus, because of omnibus accounting, uh, omnibus accounting meaning nobody owns these shares except the DTCC. DTCC is the omnibus account. We only have uh, at, uh, you know, at a distance claims to what is on the omnibus account. So DTCC, I mean, I'm using DTCC as an example. It can uh, apply to other countries where similar structures exist. Uh, so this, this is a big problem. The beneficial ownership records of not being accurate is a big problem because of two things. One is, who do you pay uh, dividends to? Dividends are paid as of the record date to the beneficial owner. The other is, how do you find beneficial owners um, uh, who are proscribed, meaning they are due to some uh, terrorism watch list or something, some beneficial owners are on a proscribed list, a banned list, and you you have to be able to detect that and not even trade with them. And all of these things are, are managed uh, in cycles, so there is no immediate or ambient regulation. And this is a big problem because after the trade is complete, after everything is complete, you may discover that uh, you know, one of the parties is on the prescribed list. Uh, this is all because of the way in which the books and records are settled uh, periodically, and also the way in which uh, KYC, AML, and uh, CDD tests are done in uh, what could be called, uh, you know, huge time periods, uh, huge time lags, meaning. Uh, one year and so on. Next, next slide, please. This is just an illustration of the number of uh, sec the value of securities held by the various uh, corporations, uh, by the various CCPs. Uh, on the leftmost uh, square is uh, the value of securities held. In the middle is the value of the delivery instructions, which is the flow through the system. So you can see it's $80 trillion held by the Fedwire security services in the US. And that is mostly because of uh, government securities, treasuries, GSCs, and so on. Uh, DC, DTC holds between 40 and $60 trillion and so on and so forth. The value of delivery instructions um, is around $600 trillion for the uh, EuroClear Bank, and it progressively goes down. So the value of delivery instructions is the flow through the system, the total flow in a year. Uh, the value of securities held is how much is held on an average uh, day during the year. So you can see these CCPs handle enormous, enormous uh, quantities of money. I mean, assets worth enormous quantities of money. Daily flow through DTC is in the order of, you know, the trans the 200 million transactions is somewhere around uh, three times GDP, just a single day. So they are obviously very important and centralized points of failure in the system. Uh, next slide, please. And th with this, I pass on, uh, you know, after the next slide, this is calls for change due to what happened in, um, in Robin Hood uh, which stopped trading and stopped the short squeeze of GME by 
stopping uh, buying of securities, but not the selling. And this is due to intermediate, uh, intraday margin calls. And as the system is designed to work from DTC to Robinhood, they had to come up with one and a half billion dollars, just like that. Otherwise, they would not be allowed, they would be cut off. Um, so anyway, now I give over to Money. I'm sorry, I, I think I've, I've taken too much time in the beginning. Money is uh, going to uh, lead you through the rest. And uh, uh, can we see if anyone has any questions before we jump into the next? next yeah, page? sure. Anybody has questions or is it too abstract and abstruse? All right, um, maybe you know we can take up the questions and I'll, I'll try to make it uh, everything short. Um, so we at OTC Digital have been you know, at this problem of bringing decentralization to institutional digital asset space and been working on for the past few years, uh, working towards standards, you know, looking at the processes and how this whole process can be the risk that is now concentrated on in, you know, on a single entity, how that could be mitigated. So there's a lot of a, you know, thought process in, 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 in work that you've been doing. And so it, it, sometimes it comes in, in timely uh, as to what happened in the, uh, with, the, with the GameStop and Robinhood uh, highlights the issues of the current market infrastructure and you know, what we are trying to do maybe uh, alleviates or reduces the risk. And you know, let's go through that. And you know, I'm gonna use a, a, you know, a recent article, a white paper from Northern Trust that had given and had indicated what is the current equity market structure to the left and what they expect to be the new ecosystem in 2030, although you know, that look, looks too, too futuristic. We think that the infrastructure that are necessary for all the uh, blockchain or, or a decentralized network are, are already there in, in, and you would start seeing some solutions in 2021. Um, I don't want to go through too much into this process. I Vipin has already gone through with all the intermediaries and why it takes, you know, uh, days to settle uh, trades. Um, you know, um, this is something that has been a legacy, and everyone wants to keep their own pie and their own uh, grip on the market infrastructure, and that's why it's harder to transform. Uh, whereas, uh, a, you know, what the market is uh, envisioning or looking forward is something of a a ledger-based solution where it can uh, be decentralized to a large extent and uh, the chances of failure or a single point failure are, uh, you know, are very, very low in the new market structure. Uh, uh, the most of the infrastructure that are required are already, you know, a lot of the blockchains in today's world are already addressing the core uh, needs of the system. Now, uh, the regulators have, you know, clearly distinguished between uh, crypto assets, you know, and and uh, securities transactions or securities uh, management, uh, in the sense that they they have a very clear prescription of the ownership and know your, you know, KYC, AML uh, requirements and uh, how. Uh, settlement must be final and between and, and parties have acknowledged. There's a whole host of, you know, uh, uh, clarification statements from SEC, CFTC, and, and you know, and, and, and even other uh, regulators worldwide had given their inputs on it. So based on which there are a lot of uh, blockchain efforts, uh, custom blockchains are now emerging that addresses the specific requirements for uh, securities processing. So, it, you know, this is the other side of it where I have been working on, not only on the equity side, we have done a lot of work on derivatives with a lot of different you know, uh, market participants over the past 15 years. You could see that this is the other, completely decentralized in a sense, but still a lot of intermediaries holding the market structure and in a, a, a essentially are, uh, you know, uh, having a hold of the infrastructure. And you, it, a lot of the uh, market structure will actually evolved based upon the 2008 uh, market reforms, uh, things like credit hubs and ex execution venues, 
market server for acting as an intermediary to provide trade confirmation. A lot have evolved over the past, I would say 10, 12 years. Uh, and, the, and the most important thing is of all is the CCPs uh, and uh, the uh, SDRs, which are, you know, the deposit, uh, which, which keeps track of all the uh, trades. And in derivatives market is much, much more complex. Uh, we are talking about trades uh, running from you know few months to few you know, 20, 30 years. Uh, the parties are mostly bilateral uh, and there's a lot of credit uh, uh, risk and market risk. And hence, hence the uh, regulators came up with um, margin and collateral, uh, we, we, we call it initial margin and variation margin, but I, I don't wanna go too far into it, but just to give you an idea of the context between cash Based settlement and derivatives based settlement. Uh, the concept is the same where you have CCPs, everybody is facing a CCP in a cleared, uh, in, a, in a cleared context for derivatives, uh, but the mechanisms are a lot more complex. Uh, and again, these screens for another uh, area where disinflation can help, uh, but it's a longer process. And, and, and to an extent, some of these post trade processes are already being addressed through blockchains. For example, Axoni has done some work. Uh, on in this area for equity swaps and they're trying to you know push it through for other products as well so but as a, a comprehensive solution is still years away um, let's focus I'm, I'm going to take a simple example and highlight um, what happens in in the actual world it, it, this is maybe a very simple example but to highlight the fact that two parties trade uh, a bunch of trades uh, I'm not going to go into the details but to give an idea uh, if, if a CCP is si sitting in between these two parties and we use a deferred netting, at the end of the day, you would net all the trades and each party would settle the trades against the CCP uh, and you know, uh, and then they move on to the next phase trades. Uh, the, this process has been happening you know, for the past 30 years. Uh, if the, in, in real world, it is not between party A and party B. There are you know, 200 different broker dealers are involved and each one trades against each other. The CCP maintains the books and records as Wipin indicated before, uh, and they would uh, settle with against each party independently. And, and that's why the, you, know, the, you would have a collateral charge and, and maintaining this collateral is critical for the CCP's uh, smooth functioning. Uh, to the, the second half, I'm just showing you what happened. Uh, again, a theoretical example of what happened given the fact that GameStop prices were all over the place when on, on, a, on uh, about a week back or 10 days back. And I'm giving you an example of what, you know, retail users coming in and doing a lot of trades, you know, buying and holding. Uh, I'm not talking about options here, just simply we're talking about, you know, cash trades and what kind of, uh, you know, collateral exposure or a net, uh, or sorry, gross exposure that created. And hence, this is just simply a few number of trades. Uh, in reality, uh, Robinhood racked up a quite a bit of uh, uh, trades uh, in the process that ran into billions of collateral requirement. And the fact that he, this is came in Bloomberg, which said DTCC on January 28th, you know, had to um, up their overall collateral requirement from a normal $26 billion on a day-to-day -day basis to a, a 33.5 billion is almost a 30% jump in collateral requirement that then in and these collateral calls were not just mostly against Robinhood but other broker dealers were also involved. This just shows what happens when you are holding and you know doing a deferred netting uh, uh, based upon a predefined well T plus one, T plus two, because of the fact that these cash is not settled for you know in a couple of days, uh, the credit uh, that is building up in the system is quite comprehensive and it can really exa exasperate the overall market risk. Uh, that's what you want to show. And in the interesting way of solving this problem, again, uh, it's another uh, example I'm showing you is what could happen in a decentralized clearing between these two parties. The critical point here is that is still they go through the netting exercise and, and they're settling, but the settlement can be set up in such a way that two parties decide how frequently they want to settle. So this settlement can happen every eight hours, every day, it's up to the parties and they could decide based upon their credit profile against each other, they could settle much, much more faster because 
on a, when these trades are recorded and operated and managed by a, a blockchain, uh, it's a lot easier to do the, uh, uh, the netting and settlement because the settle netting and settlement is only between these two parties and the settlement itself, uh, whether we're using CBDC, stable coin on the cash side and the, on, on, the, on the security side, you know, again, whatever the underlying blockchain is, they can all be done simultaneous in a matter of minutes between these two parties. So they could, if parties, two parties decide, you know, in every eight hours, they're gonna settle their uh, records against each other. They could be completing their settlement in a matter of minutes and their credit exposure to each other is, you know, back to zero. Uh, it's a very simple, again, uh, an, an, an example of a decentralized clearing. Uh, and this is something that we have been building the infrastructure for this for the past, I would say three years plus, a lot of it to do with uh, digital data standards. Um, the challenge today uh, I'll, I'll jump into the next slide to show you uh, between uh, all the different uh, uh, um, aspects of centralized market structure versus a, a decentralized, but a regulated market structure is, we, we, we touched upon the settlement duration, uh, again, operational time. This, this is where it enables us to go 24 by seven in a decentralized infrastructure. Uh, the, Centralized market infrastructure, one of the, uh, one of the classic, uh, while they do provide a large amount of netting and settlement, they go by asset classes. So that means if you take an example of a DTCC, they have a separate infrastructure or a legal entity to handle equity, separate one for fixed income, separate for derivatives. But in a, in, in a decentralized fashion, two parties can decide uh, subject to regulation, what other what asset classes they want to engage in and netting and settlement. So while you, you may not get the multilateral benefits from what a centralized infrastructure would provide, you get a, a bilateral benefit in terms of multiple asset classes. So it's a it's not exactly an, an you know an apples to apples uh, comparison, but given the fact two parties can settle at, at their own pace, uh, reduces the credit risk and also improves trading uh, between those parties, particularly between a, a, a buy side and a sell side. And, and a sell side always looks for their top tier perform, performers and they would like to do as much trading as possible. But the current infrastructure of uh, T plus two, if the buy side uses up their credit, credit line with the sell side very, in a very short order, uh, like what happened in January 28, they are cut off from trading further. Uh, in a decentralized fashion, you could, since the session timing is, let's say, four hours, eight hours, whatever the whatever the defined timing is, um, they could actually settle the whole trade some between the buy side and sell side, and then kick off uh, the next session of trading. That which means the credit utilization is much higher uh, at the expense of a little bit of more higher liquidity. Um, and this is always going to be a balancing act uh, between uh, you know reducing the credit risk at the same time. You know, uh, slightly increasing your liquidity exposure. Uh, the very extreme is RTGS, where you have zero credit risk, but very high liquidity as uh, uh, Vipin pointed out before. Uh, and the other extreme is you know, T plus X number of days where uh, you have a higher credit risk, but lower liquidity uh, or higher, higher liquidity efficiencies. The, the other interesting point, which we kind of ignore is the security. This is a single point of failure. Um, given the fact that there are state actors, you know, um, really going after market infrastructure or a national, you know, power electric infrastructures today, what stops them from going after and disrupting a, you know, a single CCP from operating? Imagine the scenario what happens if, if there is a hack into one of the CCPs what kind of a market infrastructure disruption that would happen. That's something that a decentralized marketplace can take care and, and, you know, and, and reduce that big risk. Uh, that, that's something that we don't see it until really when it happens. And it happens, it becomes a, a you know, we, we market structure will start, regulators will start simply saying, why not we go to decentralization? That's my prediction that, you know, we don't want it to happen, but we can't keep it, we can't keep praying that it would never happen. So. That's something to, very important to keep track of. Uh, settlement currencies. Uh, every CCP uses a national currency to settle. Here, you had the parties can choose any combination of, 
you know, stable fiat, CBDC, whenever that appear, whenever that occurs. And also interestingly enough, you don't need a, a currency to settle because if you really look at the crypto world, it could be a, a token, I call them a token star versus token star is a bunch of tokens being exchanged between two parties. And the tokens may not be any of the CBDCs because of the, of the trades involved. So you really get a big advantage in how you would settle across multiple uh, currencies. Uh, I, I won't go through too far. These are all the things that we know when we address it, uh, uh, addressed uh, in, in our talk now. This is the new market structure that is evolving. There are a, a blockchain that are uh, what we call purposeful, uh, purposeful built uh, blockchains that are coming up with on-chain confidential asset registry where the ident we are moving towards more of a identity-based blockchains as opposed to today, what we have in the crypto world, which is address-based blockchain. And we really, do, we really do not know who is behind each address or essentially the wallet address we talk about. Whereas in the next generation of the blockchains, I give an example of what Polymath is coming up with. And I'm sure that there are other, we have seen other uh, blockchain vendors also moving towards is more of an identity-based blockchain where the parties have identities but the, the symbols are the positions or the assets and the amounts are all fully encrypted, which is not the case in today's you know, ERC-20 or you know, ERC XYZ token implementations where the address is, 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 you know, you do not know the party behind the address, but the quantity and the amounts are very visible, which means uh, through, you know, crypto, forensics, you can really find out who the person is, then you are completely exposed in terms of your holdings uh, in, in the current market structure. Whereas in the uh, emerging digital asset or more securities market structure, uh, these things are completely encrypted, only the parties get to know. And also if you go further, the permission layer enables that the issuer, administrator and regulator may have full access to the all the entire asset registry because of either regulatory requirement or you know, uh, as an asset issuer, you want to have full visibility. Um, the parties themselves, depending upon who are collaborating on, for example, an investor working with a, a, a broker dealer and a custodian, a, a, a custodian in this case, uh, and an administrator may give only certain permissions to operate on all the assets that the investor holds. Uh, and these assets are not visible to other parties. And vice versa, a broker dealer could be actually be working with her own sets of custodians and auditor. But in reality, the investor and broker dealer might have executed against each other on an exchange or, 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 or a decentralized venue. Uh, but eventually when they are settled, these are all settled independently in independent uh, uh, data records within these asset registry. Um, it, the, you know, if I, here I'm giving you the, to, uh, to accommodate these implementation, there are now zero knowledge proofs and homomorphic encryption. That's for another day's talk. But that's, those are all this being the technology behind uh, the vendors are implementing to make this whole thing secure, uh, identifiable. And also interestingly enough, uh, you, you get to other uh, infrastructure requirements like uh, KYC, AML lockups, settlement finality. And one, another interesting thing that happens is both the custodians who are engaged in settling these assets have the final say of uh, accepting or the transfer itself because it needs both parties to uh, accept the transaction as opposed to in the crypto world today you know if i know your address i can send my you know send any token uh, to that address and you have no say over it which is what creates issues like uh, airdrops and these problems are all mitigated you know in in the uh, the next generation technology. Any questions so far before I go to just the last two, you know, couple of slides, and then we can open up further for discussions. Uh, Manny, uh, this is yeah. Kirti here. So quick question, are there any disadvantages to using such a decentralized structure? Well, you know, this is always the, ba the battle between centralized and decentralized, right? Um, the, the disadvantage in the sense, this is a much more a newer infrastructure. It is going to be a little hard, you know, it takes some time to build this infrastructure and create confidence. Uh, but it is essentially, you know, the disadvantage if you really want to look at is the liquidity. 
the liquidity provision, uh, like DTCC says that, you know, you, for every $100 of total uh, or, or whatever, if you do an RTGS settlement, the netting benefits is significant because you're only going to put up four to, I, I did, you know, there was an article about four to eight dollars. That's all I actually you're going to sell. Whereas in a buy, uh, in a decentralized fashion, you may not get that kind of an efficiency. However, you get much better through, uh, you know, credit risks. That means you get to trade a lot more with their clients, which is much more important for the broker dealers. That means they can, they can serve much better to their clients and means more uh, uh, revenue opportunities. But purely, if you want to look at the big, uh, big advantage of centralization is the liquidity provision. Uh, Thanks, and also, uh, also one more comment, uh, money is present in a bilateral netting situation, but it's possible to enlarge that group uh, to others, in other words, recreating right. some yeah. form of uh, centralized multilateral, uh, 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 <laughs> multilateral setting, uh, netting, sorry, uh, through uh, through this infrastructure, but that's, yeah. that's much more complex. In fact, netting, multilateral netting is a NP company problem. Uh, if, uh, so there are only empirical solutions, um, you know, true multilateral netting, which is a dynamic, that means, you know, it adjusts to the pace of the market. Like, let's say that you say it's two hours, but when in terms of high volatility and high throughput, the netting cycle shrinks to one hour or whatever, you know, there, there can be other, other structures, but for this, we need a highly sophisticated program. Uh, it's not just program trading. Now we are talking about program post settlement. Right, so some of the uh, solutions like uh, confidential computing, and, and there are solutions from vendors like R3 who are addressing that but that is still in research phase today. They're not, they're still in alpha. Uh, but yes, in the longer term, it is possible to have multiple parties join together and then to increase the, uh, improve the liquidity, uh, but then you are giving up a little bit on the credit risk. So it's always a balancing act. And it is very possible uh, that uh, a bilateral netting exists as well as multilateral netting exists. It's up to the market participants to decide what is beneficial to them. And also, I'd like to speak to the issue of anonymity and pseudonymity uh, regarding uh, transactional activities on DFMI in uh, opposition or uh, in contradistinction to uh, the blockchain technology. Like money, during the course of your presentation, you actually mentioned the fact that, okay, transactions on the DFMI would actually happen and you will not know the uh, the parties involved because of the anonymity of the DFMI, for instance. So in such a situation, that becomes an issue because uh, one of the value propositions of the uh, DLC itself is the fact that it's it kind of transparency, accountability, auditability, traceability, and the rest of them. So, yes, my question really to uh, get down to the brass tacks, it's, the, it's on the point is, how is this actually addressed? The question of pseudonymity or anonymity, uh, depending on where you're standing, how is it addressed in the DFMI ecosystem or atmosphere? Yeah, so it, 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 it... You do want anonymity because you do not want your, any of your, your competitors to know your uh, holdings or the, the amount of holdings. That, that's a big no-no with, 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 you know, as, an, as a participant. But at the same time, you want a transparency and accountability. Those things are all, again, these are all based upon what kind of permissions that uh, the various participants have. For example, a regulator has full account, you know, full access to the money, to the whole, uh, what it calls the asset registry. Uh, I think we have to, yeah, we have to kind of step back a little bit uh, and talk about this is not Bitcoin. This is not your normal stuff. We are talking about something very specific, uh, which is uh, polymath money. For example, is talking about polymath uh, in this example. 
anyway, go ahead, Mani. Sorry. Yeah, right. That's fine. So it, it, the, the it, you do you do want uh, complete anonymity and confidentiality when it comes to the actual positions from the individual investor's perspective or a broker dealer perspective, uh, but you want full accessibility, accountability, auditability from all these uh, let's call the regulators or administrators' perspective, and th th that's where the permissioning layer or uh, of these asset uh, of asset registry is uh, such fine grained that each one gets what they need to extract so that you are addressing the um, the needs of each participants uh, you know uh, based upon uh, you know the market condition so uh, to a large extent uh, it, you do not want and in a particular in security transaction I, I definitely if I'm an investor I do not want my investment position to be visible to any other market participants other than maybe my custodian and that's it uh, but you know for auditing purposes and administrative purposes I may give special permissions to my administrator and auditor and definitely as I said the regulator will have full access to the entire asset registry so you are having a balancing act between uh, complete uh, confidentiality uh, at the same time also addressing uh, what's necessary for the market structure uh, in, in, in terms of accountability. Did that address that or you know are you looking for more granular? I mean, uh, oh sorry, I got disconnected to just go black. Sorry. Yeah, let, let, let me just finish it up in another slide and then we can come back here. Uh, yeah. if you don't, yeah. All right. Uh, no, so no this is, yeah. So this is um, again. Um, I don't want to go too far into it, but what we are trying to say is that is we are not talking about another five six years. The market structure and the infrastructure is all being built by various players. Uh, you know, we are we are actually building more on the capital markets uh, infrastructure, leading to uh, issuance to trading. Uh, a lot of the parts because we have experience in building. Uh, DTCC platforms past, past the past 20 years, we have taken a lot of those things and you know are, are essentially rewired for the blockchain world. Um, it, it, the capital markets requires two parts to this. One is the contracts management, which you know essentially tracks the trades. These are all nothing but obligations or contracts. And then when a time a time of settlement, netting and settlement, you are actually going into a settlement platform like Polychain or it could be any number of asset chains. Uh, you want to be able to settle those things on, uh, in, in those assets uh, all uh, you know within a matter of let's say minutes uh, to achieve um, a, a much more efficient uh, netting and, and, and settlement gains. So you know beyond that there are more interesting things coming in staking DeFi we don't have time for that today uh, but that's where it goes. We, whatever happens in today's retail structure you know all those market structures now will be at, let's call it as clean, cleaned up and then presented as a, a capital market structure in the uh, in, 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 in a more regulated environment. And there are already vendors who are already looking at DeFi for capital markets, very similar to what Polymath is doing for cash security. So we, 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 we see a lot of infrastructure move now for addressing securities in this whole uh, entire life cycle of, uh, uh, of digital assets. And this will then move on to, you know, lending and borrowing market structure, then it goes into derivatives, options. So you are going to see a much, much more um, uh, market oriented approach. And that looks very different from then from what we have the current market structure in terms of an equity options or an equity swaps and the digital options and digital swaps may look much different. You know, with that, I'm, you know, I, I won't go into this, this is we already list, uh, you know, went through this thing. But the only last point I'm gonna show, which is the complex piece, which is the uh, settlement piece. Uh, again, I'm gonna go a little bit faster here for lack of time. Uh, these are two parties. How do they settle, net and settle? Uh, essentially, we maintain a contract network between these two parties uh, and we provide all these services in our platform and these parties throughout the day, you know, build their trade stuff, trades, a bunch of trades are essentially obligations or contracts, however you want to call them. And then that at the time of the session, you go through a netting process. The netting can be, you know, we will talk about session netting, but it could also be RTGS because if, if there are certain high value transactions, you may want to do real-time gross settlement. 
but you know, to make it simple, these trades will then get netted to, a, I simply am saying X versus Y with the two assets. Uh, and these assets are in two different networks, for example. So we have taken our retailer, which we actually implemented as an open source in Hyperledger last year as one of the assets. And then we are using uh, you know, uh, Circle's USDC, uh, which is a uh, which is Circle uh, a stable coin on the public network, and we demonstrate that how we can uh, uh, you know settle this thing between these two parties. For simplicity sake, if uh, party A is going to transfer uh, asset X to party B, it needs the wallet address, and that's what we are showing you the the, the party B sharing the wallet address securely uh, to party A. And party A goes through an approval process uh, of essentially the custody process of you know, ensuring that this their payment matches uh, the original contracts. And once they, they are satisfied, they will actually submit the transaction to the network, get the transaction uh, receipt, forward it back to your counterparty, who can then go back and verify the transaction that it is uh, what, what party has, party A had promises what she has delivered. And vice versa for the you know USDC, USDC securities. So this is a, a bit of a more complex exercise, but they are all happening in parallel. So if they are exchanging, a, you know, a, a, a ton of a, 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 you know large sets of assets throughout the day, everything happens in parallel. They can settle these things in across multiple networks in matter of minutes. It all depends upon whatever the delay in, the, in these assets. Uh, whatever the network delay imposed by these assets. Uh, this is just to give you a very quick example of what a settlement happens. And this is, we've implemented, we are demonstrating, and this shows the fact that you can have a bilateral execution, trading, uh, allocation, netting, settlement, all can happen independently. And that means you're talking about thousands of these you know, independent parties settling amongst themselves in real time. That means you are really creating a 24 by seven market infrastructure. I'll, I'll stop at this point. So we don't have time to go further. Um, we'll leave it to more questions. I mean, it's a little, uh, it's a little much to- Yeah, digest, uh, right? Digest, uh, but um, maybe we can have a, you know, we can break it down um, and try to, present it piecemeal sometime, but this is a quick overview in light of what has happened and what has affected uh, all of us. Go ahead. Uh, uh, Kirti, just a quick question. So this is great. I mean, uh, thank, thanks for this money and weapon. My question was more from regulation perspective. So how would regulation adapt to these decentralized models in the future? I mean, is, is, is someone currently looking at supporting these things or uh, how is the regulatory guidance on these things? Regulators are writing uh, papers every, uh, you know, I've uh, been writing papers for the last, let's say five years. Now they're focusing on, uh, you know, I mean, they, they haven't come to this, but they yeah. they are they are talking about let's say bilateral settlement uh, or DVP, but then they are aware of the liquidity uh, needs of that uh, particular situation. So BIS has published papers on this. Other central banks, uh, Project Jasper, pro, you know, various projects have uh, come up with these ideas, but most of them uh, seem to stop at. Uh, implementing some kind of a DVP, which mm -hmm. is not the solution uh, really because uh, DVP starves people of liquidity and it would uh, cause real problems. So you got to have some something in between. Yeah, just to add this on that the SEC came up with- uh, So if, if, I, if I may ask, ask, if I may ask, ask like yeah. in the DeFi space, for instance, uh, you have the automated market maker, all right? So it's an automated uh, liquidity provision process in the DeFi space to like, address the question of uh, liquidity. And um, uh, furthermore, yeah, but... also, okay, go on. 
Well, in, in uh, DeFi space, for example, is uh, run right. by over collateralization. Okay, over collateralization. Okay. That means 150 percent, 200 percent of uh, the asset has to be deposited, right? So uh -huh. the liquidity is not addressed. Well, the purpose of the AMM, the automated uh, market maker or automated market making process is to address the liquidity issue. Like for instance, use the Uniswap uh, decentralized exchange protocol. It's how uh, you have a uh, liquidity uh, process that is automated and you are instantly uh, granted or have access to liquidity if you transact on the Uniswap DEX protocol. Because generally in the uh, crypto ecosphere, there's a liquidity issue on decentralized exchanges compared to a centralized crypto asset exchange platform. But maybe you can actually educate me further when you said liquidity is not addressed. Well, liquidity is uh, addressed through over collateralization. That is a problem because you're not using your uh, money properly, right? I mean, you're depositing 150% of your assets somewhere to get 100% value from it. And this, we are not talking about, you know, uh, like capital market infrastructure, right? I mean, this is. Yeah, right. this is, yes. is yeah, so within the capital market infrastructure, yeah. there are there, there are uh, automatic, you know, exactly like Uniswap type of infrastructure is being developed, but that's going to be very highly regulated. And, and again, this is another thing that SEC and, kind of guides everyone to say move away from uh, RTGS instead because there's also a bigger issue of what if they have like 20 exchanges, all of them are doing RTGS. That's not very good for the marketplace. You really want. Uh, decentralized exec uh, centralized execution, but de decentralized clearing. That will bring you a lot of the liquidity and efficiency gains, which, you know, the most ATSs, which all the today's crypto exchanges do not, they all do RTGS, uh, which may work well for retail market, but, you know, um, SEC is not happy about it. They, they are not interested in that kind of mo uh, model. It also regarding the question of regulation, uh, according to uh, the EUAML D5, uh, European Union Anti Money Laundering Directive 5, uh, there's actually a uh, provision in this statute law that, for instance, if I want to transfer to you uh, Bitcoin, then uh, you send me your public address and I use that to transfer it to you. So there's a provision uh, in that law that this is actually a EU-wide law anyway, but then it's relevant for the purpose of understanding how to regulate the uh, decentralized finance space generally. So there's a requirement that the uh, PII of a counterparty can actually be written into the, uh, can actually be linked to the address for the purpose of identification. And I think this is a good point on how to regulate this space. This is addressing the question asked uh, earlier by one of the questions on this call. Thank you. Yeah, unfortunately, uh, we have come up to the time. Uh, uh, similar laws exist or suggestions exist. In fact, uh, they've gone, gone even further uh, to source, source of funds, which is not just the wallet that you're transferring to or from, but also the wallets that come from the outside to transfer uh, and so on. I mean, they want KYC AML, but the problem with that is who's going to, uh, who's going to keep this PII and what happens if there is a problem, you know, if there's an attack on that. So all of these, uh, things are happening and uh, we have to stop unfortunately and this uh, we will continue this discussion mailing list other places and hopefully uh, Marta and uh, or Karen will send us the link to the YouTube live if we had um, the old uh, you know if we have a YouTube live then we will publicize it on the next call 
uh, next couple of calls and then we can uh, see how the response is. Thank you all for attending. And uh, that'll be today, uh, unless you have something more to add, Money. No, that's it. Again, thank, okay, thanks, thanks everyone for your time. Bye-bye.